Hello everyone, welcome to lesson 3-5 on our unit on lower animals and taxonomy. In this lesson we will be, dis we will be discussing the phylum Arthropoda. So let's go ahead and get started. Arthropoda is by far and away comprises of most species of animals on our planet. In fact, they comprise of roughly 75% all available living animals on our planet. So they are a very big and very popular group of little organisms. If you were to take just one square mile, one square mile of arthropods and line them up, there would be more arthropods in that square mile than all of the humans over all of the planet. So that means you would have more than 7 billion arthropods. The key feature to an arthropod is its segmented body plan, its jointed appendages, and its exoskeleton. And we'll talk about these in turn uh, as this lesson goes on. So keep in mind, the things that really separate these guys from others is your segmented body plan, which it does share with the annelids, jointed appendages, so we finally see legs uh, that can, some of them can be adapted into swimmers and some can be adapted into claws, uh, but we have jointed appendages and our arthropods are our only group of animals that have this exoskeleton or an outside skeleton and it's made of this material called chitin so it's pronounced kite in but it's spelled like that c-h-i-t-i-n all right so chitin is the material that an exoskeleton is made up of there are five major classes in the phylum arthropoda we start with the hexapoda or hexapods these are insects and they're called hexapods for very good reason hex meaning the prefix of six so three pairs remember pairs two gives us six legs makes perfect sense right so when you see this on the test remember hex hexagon so six-sided polygon one two three four five six six-sided polygon six-sided feet poda means feet so hexapoda six feet or six legs in this case. There are three body segments, so you can see a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Okay, so an abdomen is always at the rear, a head is always at the front, and you will have a thorax in the middle. Okay, three body segments. An example of these are ants and bees. Our next class is called the chyla serrata. Chyla serrata are our arachnids. Here's a picture of a very, very large arachnid. Okay, that's a specific spider. These guys are actually only have two body segments. They have what's called the cephalothorax. And if you remember, cephalization is about the grouping of neurons in a head. So cephala means head, and thorax means middle body. Okay, and then you have your abdomen in your rear. So you have your cephalothorax here and then your abdomen back here. Let me erase some of these. Okay. You have four pair of legs, which gives you eight total. And your examples are spider, ticks, and scorpions. Four pair of legs for chyla serrata. So we have three pair of legs in hexapoda, and then four pair of legs in chyla serrata. Next, we have our crustaceans. And our crustaceans are things such as crabs, and lobsters and copepods. Copepods are very small crustaceans and they're typically associated as a zooplankton because they're so small. Okay, and this is an example of a very, very large crab. There are three body segments again, just like in our hexapodas, our insects. They have the head, thorax, and abdomen. Remember, our chyla serrata, our arachnids, they had the head and the thorax fused together, so you only get two body segments. So crustaceans, again, have three body segments, head, thorax, and ab abdomen. They have five pair of legs, okay? Now, for most of them, their front pair of legs have been adapted to be pincers, okay? So even though they may not walk on those legs, they are still considered to be legs because they come out of the animal's thorax. Legs will come out of the thorax and only the thorax. If something comes out of the abdomen or the head, it is technically not considered to be a leg. So keep that in mind. All legs, when we're talking about the phylum of arthropods, come out 
of the middle section or the thorax. Okay. Then we have our chylopodas, and those are our centipedes. That's a picture of a centipede right here. They have many body segments, but they have one head, one abdomen, and then you can see here that they have many, many body segments as they go along their entire path, their entire body length. And each body segment equals two pair of legs or one pair. Okay, so you have one pair of legs or two individual legs per segment on your chylopods. So that is your centipedes, one leg on either side of the body segment. So one pair of legs per body segment. And then finally we have our diplopodas. These are our millipedes. And milla in this case does not stand for million. It actually is Latin root for 1,000. Okay, so you'll see 1,000 here, millipedes, and they are uh, the class diplopoda. And the big difference here is that they're still very long. They're still very segmented, which you can see here. The difference between millipedes and centipedes is millipedes have two legs or two pairs of legs per each body segment. So if this is a body segment and you see two little legs coming out of it on either side, so two pair or four total legs, that's a millipede, a diplopoda. If you have a body segment here and you see one leg on one side and one on another, so one pair or two total legs per body segment, you get a centipede, and again, that's a chylopoda. So how do we build a bug? Well, it's kind of like you know just building a Lego set. You've got your three components. You've got your head, your thorax, and then your abdomen. You attach all three pairs of legs into the thorax. If you have a special appendage here, your abdomen does not have legs, this guy. Okay, abdomen doesn't have legs because most of their abdomens have been specialized for some form of purpose. And in this case of an ant, it has a stinger at the end of it. All right, antennae, they are joint appendages, but they are not considered legs because, well, they don't walk on them. They have a head. They have powerful mandibles for chewing things, and they have two kinds of eyes. They have um, ocelli or simple eyes up top, and they have big compound eyes uh, in the forefront of their heads. And we'll talk more about the differences between what a simple eye is and a compound eye here in just a second. So just remember that ants have two kinds of eyes. One is considered compound, and then a bunch are considered simple eyes called ocelli. And here are all kinds of different types of mouth parts that you'll see in different insects. So we're still in hexapoda here. The main ones that you need to worry about are mandibles. These are these giant pincer things, these guys, and these guys, so for chewing, and your proboscis. The proboscis, uh, this would be a butterfly, and it basically looks like one of those party favors where it's wrapped up and then when you blow a bunch of air in it, it extends out flaps and then when the air is gone it rolls back up. In this case it's controlled by a small little muscle which will straighten it out, will stick wherever it's going uh, to suck the nectar that it's going to eat and then it'll wrap back up and go on about its day. You also have other types of mouth parts such as piercing and sucking which is done by a stylet similar to um, this is not what mosquitoes look like they have something across between a proboscis and a stylet um, but just know that it's, it's similar to this, like a hypodermic needle. And they stick it in and then it's hollow, so then it sucks it through the labrum. And then for bees, we sort of have a conglomerate of all three of these types, um, or actually really just the, the, the ants and the butterflies. In a bee, you'll have a tongue called a glossa, and it'll come out and it'll kind of lap up, like a dog would be lapping up a bowl of water. And it'll go through, uh, and that lapping, whatever the nectar is that it's eating, will get controlled by the maxilla and labrum, and then it will be uh, finally consumed through the mandible and into the mouth. Okay, For your test, for the stuff that you really need to focus on, because we'll be hitting it more often, you need to worry about your mandibles, know what that is, and know what your proboscis is. Okay, So focus on those two structures. The biggest advantage that we see in a arthropod or the phylum arthropod is in its exoskeleton okay so this is exo outside of the body skeleton exo is usually outside or exiting okay it is not a shell it is better than a shell in that you can see that all of the little segments 
of the exoskeleton are basically little joints. And all of those extra little joints makes it so much easier for the arthropod to move. Okay. Now there are some disadvantages to that exoskeleton. For example, you can't, uh, it, it does not grow. So to get rid of it and for your body to grow, to get bigger, you must molt it. Okay. And this is what the scorpion is doing in this picture. It's molting. You can see the old exoskeleton being shed and this new exoskeleton or the new, the scorpion with the new exoskeleton is being emerged. Now the problem with that is during this phase, at right after molting, this exoskeleton is not hard yet. So they're very susceptible to predation. So when they molt, they typically go into hiding for a little bit for about 48 hours until the exoskeleton gets hard and then it goes about its life. Okay, so that's a disadvantage to an exoskeleton. Finally, let's get into uh, some breathing apparati that we'll see. Now we've got some cool new stuff coming with arthropods. For the first time, we really see um, the advantageous uh, or the advent of breathing. Now, yes, annelids did live on land, but they live subterranean lives, which means they live in soil and they have to be around water. Otherwise, they dry out. And I'm sure plenty of you have seen worms on the sidewalk completely dried out because they've lost their moisture. And that is one way that uh, annelids breathe is through that, okay, through diffusion a little bit. So for the first time, we've seen land animals, arthropods, be able to breathe, in a sense, on land completely. So the oldest version of this adaptation is in our arachnids, our spiders, and they adapted their gills in their old ancestors to be modified into what we call a book lung. Okay, so it's basically a gill set or an aquatic lung and was adapted to allow for the increase in oxygen. Now that is one reason why they go through all this hassle to creating these air breathing organs called book lungs and in the insects we have the tracheas and that is because there is just so much more oxygen concentration in air than there is diffused in water. Okay, so there's a lot more oxygen available to us on land than there is in the ocean. And finally, the exoskeleton itself has been modified in insects to have a series of trachea. And you can see these are all in this diagram. They're all highlighted in this dark purple shade. Okay, so in between the segments of the exoskeleton, we have all these little trachea, which allows for air to hit, oxygen to be removed, and then to be flow flowed throughout the rest of the appendages of the flea. And this is similar to what the process is in all of the insects or hexapodas. In vision, we're going to circle back now. Remember the ant that we looked at before had both compound eye, one, uh, two big ones, and then a bunch of simple eyes. And the difference is, is in a compound eye, you have multiple lenses. They're very hard to focus. This is kind of what compound eyes, the vision looks like. Okay. So it doesn't give you clear pictures, but what it does do is allow you to detect very small changes in light and shadow. That's why it's so hard to swat a fly or a mosquito from above. It's because they have these very uh, acute attention or sensitivity to these changes in light and shadow. Now the simple eyes is what you and I have, uh, also what the ant has and spiders have as well, uh, your arachnids. They have one lens, very sharp focus. You can see this butterfly wing is very sharp, but they are not very sensitive to changes in light and shadow. So there's some trade-off there, okay? We have two types of life cycles that you will see in an arthropod. You either have incomplete metamorphosis, which is this grasshopper. You can see we go from an egg, so stage one, and then we'll have uh, the juvenile form of a grasshopper or someone or an arthropod that goes through incomplete metamorphosis is called a nymph. And stage two, that nymph looks very similar to the adult. You see how the little guy here looks very similar to the adult. And that's uh, indicative or is telling of an incomplete metamorphosis. And then after several molting processes through the exoskeleton, you get the adult. So there's only three stages in incomplete metamorphosis. You have egg, nymph and adult and an example of that is grasshopper and then finally you have the complete metamorphosis 
So that is an example of your butterfly. And there are four stages. You have the egg stage, the juvenile stage in an, in an arthropod with complete metamorphosis is called the larvae stage. Then you have the pupa stage. That's where it goes into its chrysalis or cocoon. And then it emerges as an adult. The other big difference in this life cycle is that the juvenile looks completely different than the adult. So let's take a real quick look at the butterfly. We start with the egg, so number one. Then we go to a larvae stage, which in this case is a caterpillar. Then we have our pupa stage, that's where it's going into its cocoon. And then finally it emerges as an adult, or in this case a butterfly. Okay, and there's a picture of a really cool looking uh, cocoon made by a urated moth. And we finally get to our geek of the week, Carl von Frisch. He was born in Vienna, Austria. He died in Munich, Germany. And he won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1973 for his work on bee behavior. So what did he do? He came up with and discovered that bees could see in color. So how did he do this? Basically, what he did was create a couple of different trays. Uh, so these would represent the trays. And they either had water in them or a, or a solution of sugar water. And the theory was is that the bees will just go over the sugar water and drink it and only focus on the sugar water. So for example, he would have one trial where this one had the sugar water and this bright blue one would have just plain old water. Okay, And what he found was no matter where he put this bright blue block or, or colored the water bright blue, that is the only one that the bees would pay attention to. No matter where he put it on the grid, could go here, 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 wherever, wherever he put it, as long as it was blue, well, it didn't matter if it had water or sugar in it. If it was blue, that's where the bees went. So that is how he determined that bees can see in color. Okay, And uh, he also helped discover the waggle dance, which we'll show you more in class, but just wanted to introduce it to you uh, during this lecture. And that will do it for our lecture here. Do not forget about your video secret number. Your video secret number being one, two, two. So your video secret number is 122. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I will see you soon uh, on our next class. Bye now.